we turn now to the subject of Montesquieu and political thought. Uh, and central to any consideration of Montesquieu is the problem of how a thinker who in many ways is one of the most relativistic thinkers of the 18th century is also a figure who is central to the foundation of the notion of a science of human society. And it is in that interesting tension between Montesquieu's relativism and his search for patterns and order and laws of society that the drama of his political thinking can be found. Uh, let me quote Montesquieu at the outset because I think it will show immediately um, how relativistic his thinking is, but also how that relativism leads to considerations of a general order and statements that can be made truly or falsely about the nature of society. In his celebrated work, The Spirit of the Laws, Montesquieu wrote, it would be highly unlikely that the laws of one nation could suit another. Laws should be relative to the physical characteristics of the country, to the climate, to the quality of the terrain and its location and extent, to the style of life of its inhabitants, whether farmers, hunters, or shepherds, to the degree of liberty permitted by its constitution, to the inhabitants' religion, inclinations, riches, riches, number, commerce, mores, and customs. One sees there at one and the same time the relativism of Montesquieu's perspective and his search for knowable orders in society and things true or false. So the problem of relativism for Montesquieu is this issue of how much of human knowledge and experience is relative to time, place, and circumstance, and yet within that, how much we can know about the natural order of things. That problem, of course, is already inherent in Locke. Despite Locke's obvious encouragement of seeing knowledge as social and communicable, his epistemology carries within it so many of the seeds of relativism. If one's knowledge and moral ideas are bounded and determined by one's experience, then one's sense of the world, one's values, one's beliefs are indeed relative to time, place, and personal experience. Locke's doctrine of nominal and real essences establishes that all we ever know are the appearances of things. And Locke's doctrine even makes one belie one's beliefs relative to the nature of the human senses. Locke himself had asked, what if a creature had a wholly different sensory perspective? What if, for example, human beings had microscopic eyes or additional or fewer senses? How might the world and value appear to them? One of Voltaire's popularizations of Locke imagined visitors to Earth from distant space despite exponentially longer lives and thousands of senses. They lament their ignorance and how bound they are by their relative lack of knowledge. What also feeds the growing sense of the relativism of social and cultural phenomena to time and place for Europe is Europe's own encounter with foreign and, in its sense, exotic peoples, the effect of which is multiplied by the growth of printing and of the reading public and produces a curiosity, indeed an astonishment, over differences among cultures. An awareness also that European travelers seemed as strange to others as those others did to them. 
and an intense European curiosity about how the world would look if one had been born elsewhere. Europeans are so struck by variety in what had seemed to them things so essential, differences in the treatment of women and the elderly, the diversity of the world's religions, moral codes and beliefs, the difficulties of translating essential concepts in one culture into the language of another culture. Indeed, the very flourishing of non-Christian cultures seen by a civilization that believed Christianity essential to the ability of a culture to persist in civilized fashion. Europe is becoming aware of different chronologies from its own. Voltaire begins his own history of the world not with the Jews but with China. And if one looks at the reading public's taste and fancy, bestsellers of the late 17th and early 18th century include the Turkish spy, the central figure of which is a spy from the Turkish court reporting back on how Europe appears to him, the thousand and one nights of Scheherazade and accounts of American Indians and their culture. Montesquieu participates in all of these cultural and intellectual currents, but there are also personal sources of Montesquieu's relativism. His background makes him particularly sensitive to difference and to the particularity of experience. For example, he is born into the milieu of the Parliament of Bordeaux in the southwest of France. The French parliaments were courts of appeal uh, that ruled according to local tradition and custom. And no edict of the king was law in a region, a province of France, unless registered by the Parliament as consistent with that region's own traditions. Louis the Fourteenth in the seventeenth century had overridden and bullied the parliaments of France, had reduced them to obedience and submission, but after his death the great parliaments of France begin to reinsert them, uh, to reassert themselves, and growing up in that milieu, indeed participating in it, inculcates an awareness of absolutism, of arbitrary power, of local privilege, of local custom. Further, Montesquieu marries a woman who is a Huguenot, a French Protestant which deepens his awareness of issues of toleration and how much follows from the accident of birth. When as a young man he comes to Paris, he meets, becomes fascinated by and very friendly with a remarkable group of researchers at the Royal Academy of Inscriptions. Officially, their role was to decipher for the crown various ancient metals and coins and uh, records of the past that the monarchy now was in possession of. But in terms of studying the chronologies of cultures, the nature of past civilizations, the scientists at the Academy of Inscriptions became students of comparative ancient religions and beliefs they were shocked by and wrote privately about and widely discussed with Montesquieu their sense of the functional resemblance of cultures. Each has a clergy. Each has an explanation of the creation. Each has a justification of its political structure, yet all of these are substantively different in the particular. There are even personal friendships in Montesquieu's case that deeply affect his sense of the relativity of things and um, fascinate him in, about uh, how one culture 
can strike and think about another. One of his close friends in Paris was a Chinese scholar who manages the King's Chinese Library uh, in Paris, who had been a convert to Christianity in China. And he couldn't wait to get to Europe having been converted to Christianity because he expected to find a nation in which, if struck on the cheek, everyone turned the other cheek. Asked to carry something a mile, one carried it too, in which everyone was motivated, a society of believing Christians, by charity and kindness and love and the Sermon on the Mount. Um, he was, it suffices to say, quite astonished by what he discovered. And his astonishment raised very deep and fascinating, intriguing questions for Montesquieu about how is it, in fact, that belief and practice can so diverge and how odd that must seem to someone coming from another culture. In the 1720s, building on all of these experiences, Montesquieu bursts upon the literary and intellectual scene uh, in France by publishing a work called The Persian Letters, a work that enjoys uh, an extraordinary literary success. The structure of Montesquieu's Persian Letters is an epistolary novel in which Persian travelers, creations of Montesquieu, see France and the West through Persian eyes and write back to Persia and to each other about their experiences. This structure gives Montesquieu great freedom to comment both on his world and to deepen his reader's sense of the relativity of belief to time and to place. In the substance of the Persian letters, Montesquieu uses relativism to great satiric effect. His Persians look at the Pope, the King, nobles and bishops through Persian eyes with no European, French, Christian preconceptions and their comments shock and titillate a French audience. Uh, the Pope is a magician. He makes people think that three is one, the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, the king is even a better magician. By debasing the currency, um, he can make people think that ten is one. Uh, and the bishops are people who gather together to make laws of the church and then separate to sell dispensations to those. Um, that's how it looks through Persian eyes. It also raises the humor and the deeper question of ethnocentrism. A Frenchman discovering that one of these travelers is in fact a Persian says to him, but how could anyone be a Persian? Um, an ultimate expression of ethnocentric relativism. But Montesquieu is above all concerned with the deepest questions of relativism. What is, in fact, relative to time and place in human affairs? And what is natural and absolute? Montesquieu wants to know and distinguish between what is malleable, plastic, changeable in human life, and what, in fact, is common to all human experience. He looks at this through several lenses. One in terms of politics, where the Persian letters reveals an extraordinary variety of systems of power, and in particular systems of despotism relative to time and place, unbearable. The circumstance, for example, of uh, French women would be unbearable to the Persians, the circumstance of Persian women unbearable to the French, and yet Montesquieu will write beneath all that there is a natural law of liberty that revives whenever despotism is loosened. 
Louis XIV dies and France comes alive again in claims and aspirations. The ruler of the Persian harem leaves and his terror leaves with him and his wives rediscover their natural liberty. Montesquieu looks at this in terms of the varieties of ethical codes in the world, which really are quite striking in their multiplicity, and yet there is a reality of natural consequences. Nations may adopt various moral codes, but nature determines whether human beings can live together and survive and perpetuate a society with this or that given code. Montesquieu, in three works in particular, will seek to reconcile the order of nature and the variety of human forms of association. These are his Persian letters published in 1721. His Considerations on the Greatness of the Romans and Their Decline, published in 1734, and in his monumental work, The Spirit of the Laws, published in 1748. One of the central views that animates all three of these works is that amid the relativity of human perspective. There is a science that is a unifying truth. One examines the religions of various cultures. They all make different and often mutually incompatible claims. But the laws that natural philosophy has discovered of gravity, of motion, the laws of dynamics and pneumatics. These are demonstrable across cultural boundaries. And these apply everywhere to everyone. Gravity does not simply obtain in a Christian country, while Muslims and Buddhists float about without natural order. There is a unifying natural reality of the world. And science offers that unifying truth. Applied to the study of the varieties of human societies, we are able in Montesquieu's thought to look at varieties of human behavior and above all the dramatic record of ancient history and derive a model of social phenomena from that and then attempt to move on to a science of society. There is a regularity that we can discern to human nature but that human nature exists in a stunning variety of circumstances. And the task of the student of society is to recognize what are the common forms and the common laws at work beneath the surface differences of human affairs. Montesquieu strikes out in very bold, original directions when he decides to classify the essential varieties of human political association, not by their structure of power, but by what he calls the spirit that animates them, the spirit that is essential to their existence. And his fundamental distinctions is that all societies may be divided into republics in which either the whole people, 
a democracy or some part of the people, an aristocracy rule. Monarchies, in which there is the rule of one man guided by law and by custom and by intermediary institutions of power and despotism, in which human beings are governed by the will and caprice of a single individual with absolute dominion over their lives. And there are different spirits that animate each of these forms of human association. Essential to republics is virtue. Without virtue, there can be no republic, a concern for the common good, a concern for the business of the public, the res publica, the republic itself, the public business. Virtue is the principle of republican government. Monarchies depend upon honor, obedience to the rule of law, acceptance of the obligations of the rule of law, and intermediary institutions, courts, aristocracies, parliaments. In monarchies, these are intermediary institutions and all must be bound by honor. Absent honor, the whole system would fail. And despotisms are always governed only by fear. And the problem of human history for Montesquieu is the instability of these forms and most tragically the fact that what would seem morally the most desirable a democratic republic animated by the virtue of all is one of the least stable forms of human association, though all of them carry within them the seeds of their own instability and destruction. And that instability allows us to understand predictable cycles of human history. Let us imagine people governed by fear and one ruler. At some point, that fear weakens, despotism weakens. It is overthrown. And when it is overthrown, people eventually will find their way to self-governance as the alternative to despotism. And in self-governance, they create the seeds for later instabilities and transformations. In the Persian letters, Montesquieu relates this through the story of the troglodytes, an ancient people who overthrow a king, and after anarchy, they come to self-government. And they come to self-government because absent virtue or honor or fear, their anarchic state after overthrowing despotism cannot survive. They can't cohere as a society. No one fulfills an obligation. No one protects anyone else. No one honors a contract. No one will come back and do business with the troglodytes a second time. And by a kind of natural selection, the virtuous survive. And there is a period of self-government, but self-governance and virtue produce prosperity. Free, virtuous people prosper, but prosperity produces selfishness, avarice, greed, a laziness about the public business. And the troglodytes seek a king who says, I will be bound by your laws, 
but this is the saddest day in history. You are no longer virtuous enough to govern yourselves and predicts the cycle that will lead back to despotism. For Montesquieu, this is the case of Rome as well. The virtue of the Roman Republic made it the most formidable force. It defended itself so successfully. And then it conquered. And as it conquered and increased in size and militarism and wealth, it lost the virtue that animated the republic which could not sustain itself, leading to the cycle of monarchy and then to despotism. In the spirit of the laws, Montesquieu asks the question, but historians tell us again and again that there is so much chance, so much contingency to history. That's true, he asks, I mean, he answers. That's true, there are such contingencies, such a role of chance in history, but consider, if one says this republic or this empire fell because it lost a battle, one must ask the deeper structural question, what kind of a society falls from the loss of one battle? What kind of society put itself in that situation? For Montesquieu, there is a scientific and tragic lesson to the study of human affairs that there is an independent natural reality in which behaviors have real consequences and which points to universal values. Human societies indeed can achieve any number of forms, but they cannot survive unless they solve the problem of linking the individual to the broader society, of security, of equity, of justice. But such success, however, given human nature, will not be permanent. Virtue at some point weakens. Monarchy at some point becomes despotism. Despotism at some point is overthrown when fear is weakened, producing anarchy and a whole new cycle of human phenomena. Despotism is a problem in particular that quite obsesses Montesquieu. All cultures in general, and power in particular, assume that their particular forms of association are natural and never see despotism in their own behaviors. Uzbek, the Persian traveler of the Persian letters, sees all the despotism that exists in France and sees his own absolute authority over eunuchs and women in the harem as completely natural. But despotism is an awful thing. It is the subjection of one person's life to the whim and caprice of another's will. When the despot is unable to exercise terror, freedom reasserts itself against arbitrary will. Only terror can make despotism seem stable and permanent. How can one overcome this tendency toward despotism in human affairs? For Montesquieu, there must be rights and law without anarchy. There is the goal. Rights and law without anarchy. And secondly, to correct the tendency of every form of power to degenerate, there must be a separation of powers. The ideal would be to have a popular power an aristocratic, a senatorial power, a monarchical 
or executive power, but separated, each acting as a check and balance upon the other. With that phrase, one can understand full well the influence of Montesquieu upon the American Revolution and the founders of the American Republic, who indeed read Montesquieu with extraordinary passion and attention. They found in there a naturalism, that it was the task of the founders of this new republic to learn from nature, to learn from the past, not to idealize man, to project checks and balances to know that they were under the necessity of mutual restraints upon centers of power so that each might prevent the degeneration of the other. But they knew also full well that any experiment in self-government depended in the final analysis upon virtue, and that absent public virtue and respect for law, nothing on paper could be permanent or indeed even stable. Thank you very much.